Hi everyone, my name is Anna Krajinovic and today I will be talking about empirical methods for describing tense aspect and mood based on the case study of Nafsan, also known as Sautefate. So we can start by saying that describing tense aspect and mood or TAM categories is often a difficult task in language documentation, particularly because there are so many different categories and so many different labels but also because there is a lot of semantic literature that is quite theoretical in nature and maybe too much to go through when uh, doing a basic description and documentation of a language. So in order to um, bridge this gap a little bit, I will be discussing today some of the available empirical methods for studying TAM categories uh, based particularly on my experience with them uh, in my fieldwork of Nafsan. And these methods are the corpus work, storyboard stimuli and translation-based stimuli or questionnaires, uh, which are also often accompanied by metalinguistic discussions, which I will argue play um, sometimes a, a big role in determining different categories. I will also argue that storyboards and questionnaires can help us find temp functions that might be missing in the corpus, or they can also help us uncover some of the specific uh, properties uh, of TAM in the language we are studying which might also be missing from the corpus. And I will use um, uh, Nafsan Perfect as an example of this. Okay, so let us um, see where Nafsan is spoken. Uh, we have here the island of Efate in Vanuatu. Um, that is where Nafsan is spoken. Um, and uh, Nafsan has been previously described uh, by Nick T. Berger in his uh, grammatical description in 2006, but there is also some other published, wor published work. And most importantly, uh, Nick T. Berger also produced a large corpus um, based on his fieldwork uh, elicitations and uh, collections of natural uh, texts. And this was a very important uh, starting point uh, for me in my work on uh, Nafsan. And this corpus is archived in Paradisic and it can be consulted freely. So my own work on Nafsan took place in 2017 and 2018, and uh, I did field work in the village of Erakor uh, on the island of Efate, as you can see on the map. Um, and in my field work, uh, as I will uh, be uh, going into further detail in this talk, I used storyboards, questionnaires, uh, and other kinds of elicitation, um, sort of free elicitation. Uh, and all of this data is archived in Paradisac and can also be um, freely uh, consulted uh, if you're interested. Uh, so let us start with some definitions that will um, ease our way into the sort of the grammatical uh, nature of uh, testing uh, for the category of perfect aspect. So perfect aspect is a category that has been seen um, mainly as the as sort of an English category or English has been taken as a model to look for this category in other languages, primarily because um, it has some interesting uh, features in, uh, in English and therefore is always used sort of as a starting point uh, to look for uh, then more language specific properties. But these will be uh, the functions that we do find in English. Uh, so I'm here following Comrie uh, in the functions that he listed for English perfect. And the first function would be the resultative function. For instance, when we use perfect to say something like I have arrived, we're referring to the result of my arrival. So we're referring not exactly to the event of arrival, but um, what we're referring to is the time after. So the, the result state of this uh, arrival of the event. Then we have the meaning uh, or the function of hot news, uh, which is something like I have just arrived. So just immediately before. Uh, then the experiential use, which is I have been to Paris, uh, where um, the intended uh, meaning here is that I have been to Paris up, up until now or at some point in my life. Uh, then we have the universal function, which is I have been living in Paris since 2005, uh, which will be some kind of continuous state that has, that has started in the past but continues um, at present. And then we have the anteriority readings which are in English past and future perfect. For example, when you entered the room, I had already left. And here we can see that I had already left is anterior or prior to um, this uh, reference time when you enter the room. So this is another important aspect uh, of perfect, which is signaled here in English by tense. Uh, and then we also have other effects, which are not necessarily semantic functions, 
but they they often are an indication of perfect in many languages, including English, and that is incompatibility with definite temporal adverbs when we have the meaning of present perfect. So we cannot say, I have arrived yesterday. Here we have to use simple past, I arrived yesterday. So this is something we can also test for in a, in a language we're studying. And um, then what is interesting here and why I'm talking about perfect uh, is because there are other categories that are quite similar to it or overlap in their uh, functions somewhat with the perfect aspect. And that is why we're interested in figuring out whether what we have in Nafsan will really be perfect or it might, might it also be um, some of the, these other similar categories, right? So one similar category to perfect is already um, which has also been argued by Van der Klok and Mathewson that they, they indeed overlap in many different functions or they can occur in different con in the same contexts. But um, when we want to distinguish them, we should look for the change of state meaning, which is unique to already. For instance, when we say uh, the fruit is already ripe, uh, what we're saying is that there has been a change of state, right? The, the fruit was not ripe before, but now it is ripe. And this would be one of the meanings encoded by already. And the second uh, criterion they posit is the co-occurrence with past temporal adverbs. So just as we saw for perfect, we cannot say I have arrived yesterday, but with already, we could say something like that. I already arrived yesterday. Okay. Um, and uh, yamatives uh, are a second category that's actually quite recent, and it has been proposed by Olson um, in 2013 as a separate category from perfect, but nevertheless similar in some aspects. So this category would not have the experiential, universal, and anteriority functions. Uh, what then also proposes um, is that uh, this kind of yamative will be a sort of present perfect, so it would also miss it will also not have uh, anteriority functions, so it would not be like past perfect, but it would also additionally have a change of state meaning similar to already. So it will be sort of um, a category in between already and, and perfect. So what I put in bold here uh, and also in the previous slide are basically um, things that we're going to be focusing on in this talk. So we're going to be focusing on these temporal adverbs and on these uh, functions that might be decisive uh, for whether we decide if something is perfect or already or um, or a yamative. Uh, and just to have an idea of how Nafsan's um, verbal complex or the predicate structure looks, um, this is what we get. We have the subject um, proclitics, which are subject number and person marking, uh, which usually also has some TAM meanings. So um, we have such uh, subject markers uh, that also contain some kind of perfect meaning, or at least in my analysis, they agree with perfect or they're needed for a perfect interpretation. We have these general uh, subject proclitics, which do not include TAM. And then we also have the irrealis uh, version of these proclitics. And then we have a lot of different markers. Um, and as we can see here, this um, TAM marker uh, P, perfect, is the one we're going to be focusing on in this talk. Um, and basically here, there can be many other markers that can be in the slot. Um, and they combine, uh, they have some restrictions on com how they combine with these proclitics. And then we have uh, other things that can uh, happen between, right, between the subject proclitic and the verb. Mm, so let's start now talking about the methods that are the focus of this talk. So the marker P in Nafsan has been described as perfect, as, I, as I've shown in the previous slide. Uh, and this, um, when Nick describes uh, P is perfect, he gives several uh, of the functions I have shown, like resultative, um, or maybe there was also anterior and so on, but uh, some of the challenges still remain. So for instance, we get um, this P co-occurring with temporal adverbs, just as we would expect from already and not a perfect. So for instance, we have an example here. This is from the DAL questionnaire from 85. My brother said, yesterday my brother said yesterday that the wa water was cold the day before yesterday and here we have the perfect the third person um proclitic perfect and then pe uh, as perfect uh called the day before yesterday this is something that would be rather expected from already um than from a perfect so this is uh something we have to consider when labeling this category so what should we do this is um sort of an uncertainty we need to resolve in our um uh, field work and um, 
we can represent this in a table, uh, including some of the other uncertainties I had when I started my work on Napsan. So in the corpus, the functions that we do uh, find, and also in the grammar, of course, are the anteriority function, so the function of past perfect, and the resultative function. And uh, we also find this co-occurrence with adverbs, definite adverbs like yesterday or day before yesterday. But uh, what we do not find are, for instance, universal functions. So this is the one uh, I have been living in Paris since, or experiential, I have been to Paris up, up until now, right? Uh, so these are the functions we don't find, and they might be crucial for our understanding. Are we talking about a yamative uh, already or a perfect? If we knew this, it would be easier to uh, really confirm that indeed uh, this is a perfect and not um, a different kind of category. Um, and uh, there's also another um, meaning that is associated with uh, pay in Nafsan, but I will not be discussing in this talk. If you're interested, I, um, you can look at my work, my other work and uh, work in my PhD thesis about this a change of state category. That would be an additional meaning. Okay, so we have blue, which is perfect, and we have red, which will be yamative or already. And this is sort of our uncertainty we're resolving with the methods I have here. Um, okay, so I first started with questionnaires. Questionnaires of the type, um, like the general time questionnaire from DAL from 1985. Uh, you're probably familiar with this questionnaire, but there is one other that is more focused on the perfect aspect and targets specifically perfect function functions that I have mentioned um, uh, now. And this is the perfect questionnaire from DAL 2000. And I really recommend it because it goes through all of them and has a quite um, clear context uh, to elicit from. So for instance, to elicit the experiential function, we would say something like um, you meet, meet is in um, capital letters, so, and uninflected in English so that the person doesn't get a bias in translation. Uh, you meet my sister at any time in your life up to now. So this part is grasping uh, in brackets at any time in your life up to now is grasping this um, experiential function um, that uh, perfect uh, experiential perfect usually has. And um, indeed, when we look at Nafsan, this is where we do find perfect. So uh, we have sort of, uh, we're starting to resolve the uncertainty we had by not seeing it um, realized in the corpus, we see, okay, yes, we can use perfect for this experiential meaning. But the disadvantage of this uh, method is that it can only be used with speakers fluent in English and interested in these kinds of metalinguistic discussions because most people are uh, going to be, okay, you can say this and that, you can say many different things. They're not going to um, engage so easily in discussions whether one um, seems more natural or, or like, uh, what if I change a bit the context, can we say something else? Most people are not interested in this kind of discussions. So for me, this meant that I could do this kind of elicitation with one to two speakers in Nafsan, which was already pretty good because I got the initial idea of um, the distribution of perfect across all these different uh, functions. But then in order to um, really uh, test this further and get evidence from more speakers, I created storyboards, um, which are a new method also um, that has been um, initiated, I think, by Lisa Mathewson. And here we can see an article in which she explains how to really use this method. Uh, what this means is that you have a story that uh, has all these, you create a story where all these um, functions of perfect are sentences that are embedded in a context that makes sense uh, for this function to be said, uh, right, to be expressed in that way. And then you create pictures for each of the sentences. So, um, for instance, here you can see uh, um, a storyboard I created making lap lap, where the first frame is while Lily is gra grading pink taro, Mary is grading white taro. So this is a process or an activity that then results in Mary being finished. So she says, Mary says, I have graded the taro, what do we do now? So this is aiming for this resultative um, function of perfect, which here is indicated by a process leading up to a, a specific result. And the way you do this, you present the speaker with a story, you tell them the story in a language uh, in which you usually communicate, um, and preferably not in the language you're eliciting, uh, right? So you don't bias uh, specific um, constructions. Uh, in my case, this was Bislama. And then um, the speaker tries to memorize the story a bit, think maybe a bit about it, and then retells it uh, in the language looking at the pictures and without any uh, text, right? 
Um, and what this, uh, why this has, this has some advantages compared to the questionnaires? Well, the advantage is that there's le there is less translation bias. Uh, note that there can still be some translation bias because some speakers do ask for um, sort of help from the text. They, they forget what the story was about and so on. So, so sometimes there might be um, also a consultation of the text. Um, and But to me, the biggest advantage is definitely that speakers do not need to be fluent in English and allows for many more speakers being tested. And uh, for me, this meant five to six speakers in Afsan, which is great because um, this means you can have a better, well, a, a better experiment having more speakers, right? Okay, um, so let's now turn to the things that I was interested in. So as I said, we in the corpus, we had the uncertainty of not knowing whether experiential and universal functions uh, were available in Afsan. So the making lap lap storyboard I created um, is, um, for instance, contains this frame, Lily, uh, which is testing the experiential uh, function. Lily asks Mary, have you eaten, have you ever eaten lap lap before? And then we get um, the result. And this is this was uh, actually said by all the speakers that produce the storyboard. Have you eaten uh, lap lap before uh, with uh, the perfect pe? Ankuipe uh, pam kapu. So um, all the speakers produced a pe in this uh, context. So now we turn to the language specific time properties that can be tested with storyboards and questionnaires. And here I have an example from the DAL uh, perfect questionnaire. Uh, I wake up at four o'clock this morning, uh, which is intended to test whether um, whether perfect can co-occur with this temporal adverb four o'clock, which is not expected given the properties of perfect. And this is indeed what we get in Nafsan. So perfect cannot be used in this case. We cannot say I have woken up at four o'clock. We have to use a general proclitic a instead of kaipe. And so we say apilo four o'clock. Um, just like in English. Um, but interestingly enough, uh, when I talked to the speaker and discussed this example, he provided a different context where perfect would be okay with an adverb. And this is the context in which we say your alarm is set for 5 a.m., but by chance you woke up at 4 a.m. So we're setting up a contrast between 5 a.m. and 4 a.m. And here we can use perfect in order to get the meaning of what is when in English would be past perfect. So we can say something like kaipe pilo four o'clock when what we mean is I had woken up at four o'clock given this contrast with 5 a.m. So prior to 5 a.m. I woke up at four o'clock. And this type of insight is only possible because we discussed this uh, through a metalinguistic discussion and the speaker was interested enough to provide such a new context. And later I tested this also in storyboards, but um, what I really identified is that this moment of felicitation with the speaker was crucial for me to understand that Nafsan can have these two different interpretations of pe, even though it doesn't have tense, it doesn't have any other way of saying if something is present or past perfect, but in fact it is the context that establishes this distinction. And we can summarize this now and show that, um, so I didn't have time to talk about the universal function, uh, but you can see uh, that in my additional slides I will provide later. Um, we basically confirmed what was um, unknown from the corpus data. We confirmed that we indeed can get the universal function, the experiential function. Uh, we already knew about the interior and the result uh, from the beginning. And we also figured out um, through the questionnaire and storyboard uh, methodology that um, the co-occurrence with adverbs, yes, is possible in Nafsan with the perfect, but only when the intended meaning is past perfect, just as, um, as it actually is expect expected from the perfect uh, semantics. Okay, and um, just to conclude, uh, I would like to say that the preliminary work on the corpus can be useful in order to establish the hypotheses and design the methodology. And uh, translation-based questionnaires can quickly identify new functions and language-specific restrictions. And metalinguistic discussions, uh, as I've shown in the last example, are very help helpful in this case. Um, and storyboards have the advantage that they can easily test across different speakers that might not be fluent in English. They have less translation bias. Um, and um, we just have to pay attention when we use storyboards or any other materials that um, are based on uh, English structures or that have English as the, um, 
as the language being used uh, in the stimuli, we have to be mindful of restrictions uh, that exist in the English structure that might be realized in a different way in a, in a target language. Uh, for instance, um, the case uh, of lack of tense then realizes past and perfect, um, uh, past and present perfect uh, as the same category in a language that doesn't have tense. Um, and uh, if you're uh, interested in uh, seeing my slides in more detail, uh, you can uh, click on this link uh, and you will see the slides with uh, some extra materials as well. And you can also see the list of all the questionnaires that I used and all the storyboards um, and uh, my references. Uh, thank you very much.